So thank you all for coming out to our, is this third or fourth installment of Gen Labs Live Open. Uh, today we have a phenomenal guest. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Scott Schrake. I'm an engineering faculty member here and the director of the Engineering Projects and Community Service Program, also known as EPIX. I'm also the co-director for the space that you guys are in currently, the Generator Labs, and I do a whole bunch of other things, uh, some of them consequential. So uh, with me, I have a good friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Doug Melton, a former professor. So after a illustrious career in industry and a startup, he uh, went on to become a faculty member at Kettering. And uh, he's always been inspired by entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial mindset. So after that, he is now a member of the Kern Family Foundation and has been working on promoting and instilling the entrepreneurial mindset with all of our engineering students here at ASU as well as across the country. So the, the Kern Family Foundation is phenomenal. They're a big supporter of the work that we do here. They're a big believer in our students, you guys. Uh, and, and they've invested both their time and finances in helping ensure that you guys come out um, and just come out and crush it So when you get done. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Doug Melton. Thank you, everybody. What a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's always a treat to get to come and visit this particular campus, these particular faculty, and the interactions that we get to have with the students here, such as yourselves. It, we really value this, and I can't, it, that's, not a, uh, that's not an overstatement at all. It's, it's really valuable to talk to folks. And I typically try to get around the room and even talk more. But I thought, what we should do, can I ask you a question? Uh, how many people already knew Scott Schrake? How many people? Quite a few. How many people know uh, Brent Siebold? Well, so quite a, quite a few people. And the reason I ask is because I was doing my research, and I looked up their website. I ran across a picture here, th this, pi this particular picture. And I thought, I've seen this photo somewhere before. And I realized it was the Euro-Norwegian dance group called Aqua. So you can actually pick them out. But I think you should also note that they also have combustible drummers. You can see the likeness, and you can pick out each one. So with that, just to, just to shake things up, I, can I start by sharing a tool with you? So we'll get into the talk, but I actually have a preamble. And it's a tool that I think you'll, you can use. It's probably one of the takeaways from tonight. And so here's this tool. This tool is really simple. It helps you focus your thinking and find opportunities. So here's the simple tool. You actually create a little matrix. And in one axis, you might put on the top potentially game-changing technologies. And you, so, We'll go across with that, and you, see, you can see on the vertical axis, groups or individuals with common needs or affinities. All right, so what do I mean by that? I've got to show you an example of how this tool works. Okay, so let's say that you have these technologies at the top, RFID tags, carbon fiber structures, et cetera. See what I mean by the technologies? Now, look on the left-hand side, and you'll see different kind of user groups or potential customers. And so you might say, let's pick a, a cell in this matrix. Just pick a point. RFID tags and realtors. Can you even just conceive how realtors might use RFID tags to build their business? You can probably think through things like, well, they could walk into a home and maybe they've got uh, some sort of RFID tag that causes a message to come up so that they can explain a certain feature of a home or something like that. So you can, and you can run through different ideas and what this tool does is simply focus your thinking. Here's a couple more. Lumber yards or big box stores and RFID tags. Maybe asset tracking, right? So this tool is real simple. It just kind of forces you to think. I'll even put another check mark up on there so you can see tool manufacturers and say selective laser centering where you can actually do 3D building of metal objects and tool manufacturers. Well, maybe tool manufacturers want to create something. Maybe they need custom tools 
And so anyway, I hope this kind of starts you thinking about something. We're going to take this one example further. So I threw up on this particular matrix, threw up project management, ergonomic design, machine design, material testing, and I just picked one, a couple of cells and I said, there's something, you might even think it's crazy to pick this particular object, but I picked floor sanders. It's a little bit random, I know. So the reason I chose it is because I saw somebody use one of these floor, how many people have ever used a floor sander? I would not expect very many people. You've used a floor sander before. Yeah, you've used a floor sander. Any issues? Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, floor sanders, for those of you who don't know, look like that. And maybe you peeled up tile and you've got to clean off the glue or something like that. And they have specs, so they have technical specs. You can look at the torque and how they work and all of those things. So there are engineering details, right? You would agree, you got to design something. So you can think through that. And you've got to use these things. So here's an example, just a little quick example of somebody using one of these floor sanders. I think the gentleman's gonna start in just a moment here. This is typically what happens and what happens to me <laughs> when I use a floor sander. So real quickly, one more time, that's not how it's supposed to work. So you take that idea and you need that customer interaction, right? The reason I brought this example in is because along with that matrix, you can start thinking about your customers and how do you get information about customers? All sorts of different ways. So people have come up and they've said, this floor sander doesn't do that. Now I pick floor sanders as just a random, completely random device. And you might, this talk has no more floor sanders in it, so put your, <laughs> put your mind at ease. All right, here we go. Here's the talk, that was the preamble. ASU and Keene have been working together. In fact, Keene is a group of universities that believe that entrepreneurial mindset is critical to the nation, to your community, to you as an individual in creating value. And ASU is a great contributor to this particular network. And so I'm really glad that ASU is part of it. To explain a little bit how, what this talk is about, I think it's helpful to say, are you an entrepreneur, innovator, or inventor? Before you answer that question, think through what the definitions of each of those are. In fact, I'm gonna prompt some of that as we go through this talk. And don't, some of you are probably already at the point saying, well, I'm a combination of all three. Some of you might be saying, well, at certain times I'm one of these, and at other times I'm another one. So let's, let's take a look at a few uh, topics around this. When I was in school, I was obsessed with what is going to be my big idea. What's going to change the world? Anybody else ever feel that way, even on occasion? Good. That's a, that's a good showing of hands. So at some point, you might say, what am I going to do that's big? And where do you get a big idea? So they say, psychologists say that uh, during the average day, people have about 60,000 thoughts. Now, I don't know how they discretize those, but that's about 60,000 individual thoughts. I'm going to do this, I'm going to drive here, and you make decisions or have thoughts. And they also say that only about 5% of these thoughts are new or original. So how do you take advantage of that? Where do you get your big idea? I have a favorite author, John Steinbeck, truly is my favorite author. You're familiar with things like Grapes of Wrath, Mice and Men, all that. He had, a, he had a comment about ideas and where he got ideas from. And he basically said, ideas are like rabbits because once you get a couple of them, you're gonna have a bunch, and you need to have experiences to get these ideas. So I've really taken that, that to heart, and I think that's, that'll serve as we go through three cases, okay? So the, what I've got up here are three cases, and this becomes interactive at this point, because I will be asking you 
about these individuals in each of these cases. And I think it's, it's useful to talk about, are these individuals in each case an entrepreneur, an innovator, or an inventor? So as we're going through one case, and they're pretty quick, as we're going through these, one of these cases, just think about that. Here's case number one. Case number one starts with a coupon. So a civil engineer, David Phillips, discovers a coupon. The coupon says that if he buys a particular product from a particular company, he gets airline miles. He does a little calculation on this. In fact, there he is. He discovers that if I buy this product, I, the airline miles are actually worth more than the product. And so he decides that he can buy the cheapest product from this company possible, and you can see he's holding a pudding cup there. So he starts buying pudding cups to get the airline miles, uses these coupons. And so he, he goes around areas of California buying the entire store out of pudding cups. And it's multiple stores, it's multiple cities, buys 12,150 pudding cups for $3,140. Okay, so this guy's got a plan. There was an issue. So before you look at this, let me tell you about the issue. Each one of these coupons had to be filled out by hand. Oh, this is a, this is a nightmare. So he came up with an idea. What if I get, donate these pudding cups, because I surely cannot eat 12,150 pudding cups, but I donate them to Salvation Army, and then I enlist their team to fill the coupons out by hand. Also getting a tax deduction from, from the result. Right? <laughs> okay. Are you doing what I asked? So think about entrepreneur, innovator, Inventor, maybe you'll say none of the above. That's fine, just think about this. Where are we going with this? So, I gotta give you the punchline though. The end result is he gets 1,253,000 American airline miles. Very interesting, the guy says I can travel anywhere, but I can't afford to stay there. So, <laughs> fascinating. Louis Pasteur says, Chance favors a prepared mind. That's certainly what happened here. This guy had an engineering background, had a math background, and didn't just take this coupon and dismiss it, but for some reason had a mental evaluation of what was going on with it. So, Phillips must be a curious sort, don't you think? And let's ask you the question now, and in fact, I wanna hear from you. So, is this entrepreneurial thinking? Is he an innovator? Is he an inventor? Any comments or none of the above? And there is no judgment here. Anybody? Yeah, what do you think? Think as an innovator. Any, any you wanna add to that as to why? You don't have to, but I'm just looking for any input. Okay, so just, just to repeat this so it ends up on the tape and also ends up, uh, you, you can hear it well. Uh, the gentleman said, I think he's an innova innovator because he took a system and he figured out how to use it. Did you actually say abuse it? He said abuse it. So are there ethical issues here? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm open to you, your opinions. Could I hear another opinion? Anybody differ? Yes, sir. Mm, there's something about that, isn't there? There's, a, there's not really a sustainability plan here, but there's something about seeing an opportunity, right? Anybody else want to offer something?
This gentleman up front, just so you can hear, said that he seized an opportunity, and that was the focus of, that was the emphasis that you're, you said he's an entrepreneur. Now, I know we could go on all night, and that is part of the fun of this, because I don't set these up to get a specific answer. I really don't. I'm not gonna tell you, well, here's the answer that I believe. I really think it's healthy to think about what thinking is going on in this individual's mind. Not making a judgment call. You can, you can make the judgment as an ethics call, but this is really just to introduce what's the thinking process behind this that seized an opportunity, okay? All right, you ready for case two? What do you do? Everybody knows, what do you do? Where's Waldo? Okay, I know some of you with uh, particular fixations are already looking for Waldo. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't help but not look for Waldo. All right, I'm gonna help, I'll help, okay. So a little bit in there, some of you have already found him, a little bit in there, and you've found him. So this is a message from Waldo to you. All right, Jen Labbers, which is you guys, propose a business venture for Waldo, but first look again at the big picture. We have a tendency when we're presented a problem to just fixate on what is the answer. Do you know what I mean? Somebody puts a test question in front of you and you just, all I got to do is solve that. When I go shopping, I have this problem. I'm shopping for this particular item. I don't see anything else in the store. Everything else is just a blur till I find the item. That puts us at a handicap sometimes. And so the handicap can be overcome if you really step out every once in a while and look at the big picture. Would somebody just throw out some ideas on what Waldo could do for a business in this particular setting? Crazy or not crazy? Just throw out any, any ideas. That's very specific. I think you're hungry. This person said, <laughs> sell fresh fish from the ocean that they fry up on the beach. All right, anybody else? Suntan lotion application business. Interesting one from you, Dr. Shrake. Anybody else? Surfing lessons. Some people have, have suggested that you could do uh, swimming lessons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes when you take a step back and look at, a, at the bigger picture, you can see the context. I will introduce you to another Waldo that you don't expect. This is Waldo Simon, okay? Waldo Simon is a chemical engineer, and this particular chemical engineer worked for B.F. Goodrich. His boss asked him to make some rubberized compounds that would be appropriate for tires or adhesives. He goes to put some things together, builds a uh, product, that ends up being hard. It's a, it's a little bit pliant, but it's, it's, it's too hard. It has no adhesive quality. He decides this is a, another failed result and initially throws it away. But on second thought, he says, maybe there's value in this product called polyvinyl chloride or vinyl which became the second largest selling or is the second most selling plastic of all time. Part of this is probably stepping back and saying, what's the bigger picture here? I'm not just solving the task. I've actually stepped back from this. The guy goes on, you know, it's kind of like the John Steinbeck situation. Get a couple ideas and you have a lot of ideas. So he ends up with how many, 116 US patents many of them very, very valuable. So, whoops, I don't want you to see that yet. I want to ask you a question. Is Waldo Simon an entrepreneur, an innovator, or inventor? Anybody, and we'll just take a couple responses. What do you think? You in the back, sir, you had your hand up. Okay. Okay, he says entrepreneur, anybody differ? He's all three. He's all three. He's all three. Okay. Because they're all something similar. It's just one over introducing a new idea, that's what they have similar. So the three things that make them different. The innovator brings out a new process or device, but oh, that's the inventor. The innovator brings a new idea. Mm -hmm. So 
So, okay, so you say all three and you gave reasons on why in each case. I've had some people that said, he is nothing but an inventor, which is not disparaging, by the way. But he's an inventor at heart because he's created so many patents. That's fine. Again, this is not a judgment. I'm just wanting you to think about how you think and kind of use these definitions to prompt it. You ready for number three? Number three is the wackiest one I've got. So, number three, actually you can see a patent drawing up here. Case three, I don't know if you can figure out what this patent drawing is about. Let me give you a clue before you make any guesses about this thing. This is, well, I'll just tell you. If you uh, have a sucker and it's difficult to rotate and lick that sucker, you might need a rotating sucker pop. So here's the story, and you've got to work with me on this. The, the story goes like this. There are two postal carriers, and I'm going to tell you their name. Help remember their name. It'll help the story. Coleman and Schlatter. Coleman and Schlatter are two postal workers. They're out on Halloween night. They see what their kids are doing. They're getting candy, and, they, and suddenly an idea comes to them. The idea is not this. The idea was actually, what about candy if it had lights in it? Well, they took that idea and they, in your language, pivoted. <laughs> and they ended up saying, what if suckers rotated? And they actually patented this. Okay. Now, you, before you make any judgments, because this is a non-judgment space, don't make any judgments on the value of this, okay? Just hold off on that. It's a little bit odd, it's novelty, but don't make any judgments on the value. The interesting story comes when the third person comes into the, to the, the picture. So the third person is John Osher. So just for review, we got Coleman and Slaughter, the postal carriers, and we got John Osher. All right? John Osher is the candy captain. He basically controls a lot of the distribution for candy. Interesting, good person to know if you're trying to build a device like this. They collaborate. They end up building this rotating sucker pop, getting it in Walmart stores and everywhere. Have you, anybody ever seen one of these things? Raise your hand if you've seen one. Okay, anybody ever bought one? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> All right. So, this guy gets involved in this, and I think the interesting part of this story is where Coleman and Schlatter and John Osher kind of diverge. So I want to work on one storyline. Let's take the Coleman and Schlatter story first. After an invention, what would you be likely to do? Do another one, yeah. right? Wouldn't you want to, you'd say, oh, that was successful. So you might, yes, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> the, this took four years, as you can see in the title. To come up with the dual rotating sucker, a novel device. Now, I, this is not a judgment space, people. I can see in your eyes, all right? All right. So I want to tell you the rest of the story here. The rest of the story is, in 1998, rotating chicken sucker or some other device. And it's actually in the claims. How many of you have read a patent before? You looked at claims in a patent. When you take a patent, there's often these this, this part at the end of a patent that has to do with where the intellectual property, what, what niche are you trying to carve out? And if you read the claims in this particular patent, it talks about the particular niche is putting lollipops in kind of animals and stuff like that. Okay, and the patent office passed it by and said, I approve this. Later came rotating lip gloss, 10 years later, now, again, it's a little bit comical, but don't judge this. There's some success. They had some success with these inventions. But I want to put this in contrast, in juxtaposition with the other storyline. So the other storyline is about John Osher, the candy captain, all right? Because of the work that's done in these devices, you know what he got good at? He got good at building small plastic geared systems and outsourcing those. So he did something. He said, 
When I go shop for a toothbrush, in fact, there's a story about him going into Walmart. He looks on the left-hand side and there's the $2 toothbrush. Looks on the right-hand side, there are the Sonic, ultrasonic toothbrushes, which at the time were about $100, $150. And there's nothing in between. So there's a gap, if you will, that the market probably could fill. So he did a gap analysis and said, what about a low cost, maybe a $15 type of product? I already know how to make plastic gears, so I'm gonna capitalize on that and just do it again, but I want to find the opportunity, not just create another invention. So do, you, do you see what I mean by these two stories diverging? Okay. This one has a pretty happy ending. <laughs> so the product sells to Procter & Gamble spin brush you may have used one or you've seen these things and basically that's the product that actually evolved from the rotating sucker fascinating so there's two storylines and i think i kind of gave it away maybe i didn't john osher certainly kind of capitalized on opportunity identification both actually had a skill went in and found a gap but had a habit of mind that this is what you would do. So the way he thought, and always thought, continuously thought, is how do I exercise this and find these opportunities continuously? And it was focused on how do I create value for somebody else? I find a medium cost toothbrush in this case. Again, no judgment on the impact of this. It's not saving the world, but it had high impact, it had high volume, and so the impact is somewhat there, okay? Now, I don't know, do you, anybody want to comment? Let me just open it up for comments because you might, you might say Coleman and Schlatter were this and John Osher was this. Anybody? This one might be a little more obvious and a little more set, yeah. The, the gentleman said it's a group effort and everybody contributed. The only bad news about that is the inventors did not capital, the inventors didn't end up with that final product that filled a, a market need. So they started off a group effort and had some success, but then their stories diverged. Anybody else want to comment? Did everybody hear that? Because you need to hear that. Oh my gosh, that's, that's, that is well articulated. Uh, entrepreneurial mindset made a difference and the entrepreneurship made a difference in the two storylines. And it's not a comment on who was the happiest, right? It's just a comment on impact, all right? So, I put a bonus case in here and I think you may know this uh, particular, whoops, you, you might recognize this. This is just, of course, a popular story these days, well publicized uh, from SpaceX, right? And we're talking about the, the rocket that lands vertically. And they've gone through their incidents that they've had. But you look at that and you go, oh my gosh, it's almost weird because it looks like reverse video, doesn't it? You think, how do you do that? And I've spoken with some people in aerospace and they say, the biggest challenge of this thing is you've got shifting weight inside this because of the fuel. And so getting that thing to balance and land like that is just incredible. Now, here's your, here's your last call. Uh, entrepreneur, innovator, or inventor? Somebody who hasn't commented before, yes sir. I, or the company, but I am, yeah, I didn't actually call out Elon Musk, but we might as well, right? <laughs> I feel like he just attacks any industry that he wants to disrupt. He builds something out of it and then gets a bunch of people together to build a solution and make great value and then create stuff like this. So, I don't know if it's 
So the gentleman says entrepreneur. Let's see any other opinions. Okay. Some any differing opinions? Some people have commented about an innovator. They've they've said this is innovation. But I r agree with the two commenters here tonight that this is disruptive and it's based on an economic model. And so it suggests there's a strong entrepreneurial piece in there. All right. So that is just, these were just prompts to get you to think about something. And what I'm hoping you're thinking about is how do I approach a situation? You've got a particular, every time you encounter something, whether it's a coupon or whether you're in the store looking at products and you see a gap, you have this opportunity if you develop this as a habit of mind and the only way you develop habits it's like exercise, right? The only way you develop muscle memory is you exercise and repeat. And so there's this opportunity to kind of drill into one of these types of thinkings or all three. And the point is you really do, I think you made the point uh, the, wonderfully that the entrepreneurial mindset, when combined with a skill set, and you gotta do something, right? Leads to success and impact. And so I wanted to point out that at, uh, uh, we just uh, met, I just recently met Sarah who went through the EPICS course, Dr. Shrake's EPICS course. And if you take those things, she has an entrepreneurial mindset, her whole team does. And they've combined that with a certain skill set which includes mechanical engineering and other engineering types. And they've taken action. Oh gosh, that's critical, the action that they've taken. That leads to the success. So there are wonderful examples, and you're one of, you're, you'll be the next example, I hope, that we get to put up on the screens and hear about at ASU throughout this network. So I also want to tell you something else that I think you'll find fascinating. ASU in this network is contributing as well as receiving from the network. And so one of the things that they've contributed is they've helped kind of carve out a framework. And I don't know if you can see it, especially from the back, but it focuses on being curious, creating value for others, and connecting information so that you can get some insight. This is being built into classes that you might be taking. This framework is helping drive the way that education is not only going at ASU, but will be going across the nation. It's pretty powerful. So, you can grab this presentation from, uh, I've got a bit.ly up here, you can grab this document, and so on. And with that, I want to give an acknowledgement to the foundation. The, the foundation is a uh, organization that was created from somebody, from, an, from a pair of individuals, husband and wife team, that created a company and really represented a lifetime of entrepreneurial engineering. So the grants and the types of resources that we can provide all come from specific work from an individual who donated to create this foundation because of the entrepreneurial mindset. So, I'm, I'm so glad to be able to do the work. I'm glad ASU is involved. And I just want to say thank you guys very much.